All right. It is uh, bourbonbelong.com's Cigar Saturday Live. It's Maddie Rock. It's Sanj right there. It's Sanj's. And I, I, I'm very uh, happy to introduce uh, this guest who really needs no introduction. I see him. Um, I see he's just in the lobby right now getting ready. Um, Maddie, here he is. It's Paul Rosenberg. How's it going, Paul? Yo, can you hear me? We can yes, hear I you. Can. How are you, buddy? Good. Yeah, man. I'm doing good. Good. Doing good. Just uh, here, set up in the man cave. I oh, wish nice. I was. I wish I was at Sanjay's. I say that often. Yes. Yes. I wish I was at Sanjay's. I'm going to make a melody up to it. If you say it, it one more time, you'll you'll be here. Yeah. It's like, candy, it's like the Beetlejuice thing. What's that? Hanging in there, brother. How was your day, dude? Uh, pretty good. Just got in from the city, but I got this like, I don't even really have allergies. And I got out of the car when I got home and I got this like wild sneezing attack. And now I've got like this crazy congestion and I can't smoke for a few minutes because I, I probably won't be able to breathe. So I'm just going to be like hanging out here for a minute. Right on, man. Get your breathing what? olfactory all back together. Yeah, <laughs> hoping it's gonna, <laughs> hoping it's going to calm down. But with like all the the smoke dust remnants here in my man room. I don't know if that's in the cards, but we'll see. So uh, man cave, uh, you, you do some cigars in there. You, I hear you're also a whiskey spirits fan. What do you like to drink? Yeah, I, I um, you know, I used to be really um, only, only into scotch or mostly into scotch. And then right. uh, I just, I felt like bourbon was just too heavy handed for a right. while. And then, um, you know, over the past few years, I started drinking more bourbon um no pun intended warming up to it and um you know i'm starting to like a, a a lot of stuff and um you know i probably uh would say i'm a little more knowledgeable about scotch than i am bourbon but um right. i like them both excellent also, also a beer drinker um you know i don't shy away from too much but i'd say primarily uh beer scotch and bourbon Right on. Those are uh, those are among my tops too. Do you have a favorite pairing? A favorite, uh, whether it's bourbon or, or scotch, that you like to put with uh, with a cigar? You know, my my go to um, is you know it's hard to say because I, I I find myself not loving to pair that much for some reason because I feel like both a cigar and a whiskey are very strong, um, strong enough by themselves, and they also have their own subtleties. And I feel like when, when you put them together, um, it sort of often takes away some of those subtleties. One overpowers the other. But um, if I had to say, I would I would say like my go to is like a, a Macallan Twelve and uh, anything Cuban. Right. Yes, I I like the Macallan Twelves uh, as well. Uh, yeah, I like it more than the eighteen. Yeah. I feel like the eighteen is too woody for me. Right, right. I definitely like the uh, the 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 double uh, Macallan twelve with some uh, cigars. Maddie, what are you pairing there? You're having a uh... oh look. Obviously, an honor with uh with Paul being there. I had to be smoking the Undercrown Shady. So yes, in, in Paul and M's honor, had had to do it. Uh, everybody knows I'm I'm an Undercrown guy. Like I said, yeah, it packs the perfect amount of uh of of natural sweetness in it. Uh, medium to medium, full, uh, robust. And as I've said many, many times, this particular stick and this particular configuration with that box press for me, uh, one of my favorites. So wound up being a great stick for uh, for that collab with Drew Estate and Paul and M. And I love them. So obviously I smoked through quite a few of them. So I'm feeling feeling a little shadier than usual today. And, uh, <laughs> and see, you guys have the adult beverages, but I'm I'm living vicariously through the health gods today. And uh, walking is keeping Sanj and I healthy. So I'm actually drinking a cold organic pressed juice with uh, Berry Banana Bliss. So the living vicariously will definitely have to go through you guys. <laughs> Berry, but I like it. Berry I, Banana. I, I'm not sure about what type of pairing story I'd like to do with the Shady and the, uh, the Banana Berry Bliss. But I, I'm liking them both. The Shady a little bit more, but I like them both. And, and I and I do love that shady stick, and I've had a number of them, Paul, on uh, our Cigar Saturday show. I didn't have any nearby. I'm smoking the uh, the Florida Sun Grown right now, and I am pairing it with uh, one of my favorite bourbons, 
uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. It's the Peerless, and it is a special single barrel batch they picked, and they called it Vintage Cigar Box because they got a whole lot of cigar notes on this. So nice. Yeah, well, I, I, do have, I do have a stick that I didn't like yet. Um, right. I, have one of the, I have an H99 um, that was given to me by JD. He, uh, he gave me a box of these, some very lucky individual. Um, so I knew Maddie was going to be on. And this, Maddie, this is in your honor, my friend. Thank you, brother. I appreciate okay. you, Maddie. And then um, I've got a friend who used to be with me um, over when I was running Def Jam. Uh, his name's OJ Lima, and he's got a um, a – a bourbon, online bourbon company um, where they do small batch, uh, single barrel selections. And um, yeah. it used to be called DIY. And here's here's the thing that I'm drinking now. Um, it was called the Zeus. And uh, it's a single barrel. Russell. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. I'm gonna look up what their what their website is, but they've got some really great stuff up there. Um, and so I'm drinking I'm drinking some of this single barrel stuff right now. Um, yeah, and it's going good. Yeah, those those Russell Reserve single barrels are uh, are really incredible. A lot of good flavor, a lot of depth. Uh, everybody watching, tell us what you're smoking, drinking down below. It's Bourbon Blog Live. Take a moment, like and share this video. And uh, any questions for Paul? You know what to do. Tweet us back. Ask him down below. Taste select repeat dot com. Taste, Taste select repeat. repeat. Okay, he, I'm gonna check that out. Oh, play it. I like they, that. They just dropped an old forest old forester single barrel uh, this week as well. So nice. I just got a text message outside of this asking from my uh, my boy Daver what your favorite bourbon is, Paul. My favorite, <clears throat> my go to, um, is probably Michter's. That's my go-to. It's a good one too. Yeah, yeah very nice. Like my, my sort of every day. I mean, I don't drink bourbon every day um, as much as I'd like to, but uh, it's it's my my sort of go-to. If 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 McCallum is my go-to for Scotch, I'd say that Michter's is my go-to for bourbon. Yeah, both uh, McCallum and Michter's. Yeah. Two M's, M and M, in fact. Ah, that was, oh, that was, oh, that was yeah. just silly. That was silly, but I do like both of those whiskeys. It was uh, probably, uh, you know, some sort of subconscious pick on my behalf. <laughs> it might have been. It yeah. just, it just might have been. Well, Paul, it's it's great to have well you on played, Cigar well Saturday well Live. Play hashtag, buddy. Yeah, it could be. This could be the M M&M, and uh, the whiskey. Um, so, uh, uh, any questions again for Paul? Uh, ask away. And uh, what's been happening your way, Paul? What do you, what have you been working on? Oh gosh, you know, I've been working on a bunch of stuff. We have. Um, I launched my own label called Goliath Records um, last year, right right after the pandemic started, which was uh, unfortunate timing. But um, we put out uh, our first artist, a kid named Vince Ash from uh, from Indiana, who's really great. Uh, looking for more stuff there. Uh, just signed something new to my label with Eminem, Shady Records, that we're going to announce pretty soon. Um, working on a sophomore album for our artist on Shady Records, Boogie. Uh, working on a Conway the Machine album for Shady Records. It'll drop uh, hopefully at the end of the summer. And then, um, you know, beyond that, we've been uh, just started to get into the uh, NFT world a little bit. We did a drop uh, about a month ago with Eminem on Nifty Gateway. So I'm really, really exploring that whole world um, in depth and trying to see where things are going to go. I, I feel like... Um, not that you ask, but but I'll say it anyway. I feel like we're just really in the very early stages of uh, blockchain technology and, and seeing where that's going to go. Um, you know, if if like dial-up internet and AOL um, was where we were when we had those those old modems, I think that's the place we're at with with blockchain technology now. We haven't seen um, you know social media or whatever is going to be down the road. Web 2.0, Web 3.0, whatever we're in now. So uh, I think that's exciting, and I like to definitely stay involved in whatever is the latest and greatest um, in technology because I think that um, it's leading so much of our industry these days. So, um, yeah, you know, looking forward to things opening up, maybe get some shows on the books um, at some point, and uh, just keeping busy, man. 
that was just another question I got through a text too, is what do you think is going to happen with the touring circuit? And uh, when are people going to be, be going back out there? And when's Evan going to be dropping more shows? And uh, so it was two texts for the price of one kind of thing. So number one, how does, how do artists feel about going back out there? And obviously then you got to do the flip side of it and see how crowds are and how, what their willingness is to be back going back out there. Yeah. Look, I, I think every artist is different. Just like we're all different as people and, and what, what our level of, um, you know, risk we're, we're willing to expose ourselves is, you know, um, I mean, we've got packed basketball arenas already, right? I think um, the Madison Square Garden is already at capacity, and I think tomorrow night where uh, the Nets in Boston and in the Boston Gardens um, is going to be at capacity. So, you know, I think the, the days of, um, you know, and that's indoors, right? So, and, and summer's on deck. So there's going to be plenty of places and, and um, shows outside. I think people will slowly start warming up to it. People are going to be doing shows outside first. Um, there's a lot of festivals happening. Governor's Ball's on in New York. Um, summer Jam, bro. Who's this happening? Yeah. Uh, summer Jam. You know, all, all those things are happening. So I think that as the fans get used to it, as more artists are performing, more artists are going to get used to it. And I think... Um, you know, barring some sort of resurgence of, of COVID or some, you know, wild maniac strain breaks through or, or um, you know, we have COVID-22 or whatever it is. Um, barring any of that, uh, <laughs> we uh, we should be back up and running, at, you know, next year full blast, I, I think. You know, I don't see why not. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps a little quicker than we thought we would, and hopefully it will just uh, become all the quicker and... Um and all the better. Okay, a few questions uh, coming in for uh, Paul here. Uh, see John Rios watching us. Um, may, may go back to the story a little back in time there, Paul, but how was the first meeting with Eminem? I guess the first time you met him. Um, well, the, the, the first meeting with Eminem wasn't a meeting with Eminem at all. Um, it was a um, kind of, I, I want to I say an audition in a way. Um, he, his best friend, um, rest in peace, is a guy uh, that, that many of you know as Proof. And at the time, Proof was the um, host of an open mic event that happened on Saturdays at a place in Detroit called the Hip Hop Shop um, on Seven Mile Road. And I was in law school at the time. Proof knew that I was studying law and you know wanted to, at the time I thought I was gonna be a music lawyer. Um, so I would go up there every Saturday, check the town out, hang out with people who were my friends and, and just sort of get more involved and connected with the artist community, um, in, in the city. And there was one day where Proof pulled me aside and he said, you have to stay after the battle today and I need you to check out a friend of mine. And I said, all right. No problem. You know, Proof was like, you know, the mayor of the Detroit hip hop scene. Everybody knew him. He knew everybody. And, um, you know, him and I were friends. So I said, all right, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll stay. No problem. And he's got this snicker on his face and, and uh, snicker and going and this smile on his face. And I said, what, what, what's that about? What, what's going on? And he's like, yeah, he, he's a white boy. And I said, oh, OK. And at the time, you got to think, this was 1996, right? Um, there was not a whole lot of white rappers. And, and the ones that were around and had been, um, you know, out on the scene and, and released nationally, um, some of them were, were, were okay, some of them weren't so good, but um, not a whole lot to choose from. It certainly wasn't considered to be a uh, favorable thing at the time. But said it to me because he knew, um, as some of you may know, that that I was actually a rapper before. So he was trying to get under my skin, like I got a white boy that's better than you. So that's that's where that came from. Anyway, um, stayed around, and he cleared out the hip hop shop, and this kid walked in um, with this baggy sweatsuit on and an almost shaved head, looked like he just rolled out of bed, and this was Eminem. And he rapped over a few beats that the DJ played, and uh, he was really good. And, and I thought he was he was talented, but it wasn't like 
you know, the, the, the skies parted and, you know, the sun shined through and it was like, you know, the next coming of, of hip hop. It was just, you know, he was, he was a good rapper. Um, so I told Proof what I thought, met him, said hi, and uh, went on my way. And then a few weeks later, uh, maybe it was a couple months later, he started selling um, what was his independent debut album at the time called Infinite, um, hand to hand to people at the hip hop shop. And I bought it um, from him on cassette for six bucks. So I'd listened to that, thought that that was really good too. But at the time he wasn't, he, he hadn't found his, his voice yet. And he really sounded a lot like other artists that were out there and didn't have his own thing. It was very derivative, um, which, which he knows and he, he fully admits. So I stayed in touch with him um, and uh, eventually he started sending me music when I moved to New York that sounded more like what you know Eminem as uh, now, or at least what he was in, in the late 90s. Um, and that's when I knew we really had something. So that was a long way of telling what our first meeting was like, but without following up on what the first meeting was like, it kind of wouldn't be much of a story. So there you go. Right. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's a good story. That's some good background. And, um, what, as you said, how, how he found his sound, what, what was that evolution like from what you saw as he was finding his sound? Well, honestly, it's, it's, he, he sort of, he, you know, for lack of a better description, stop giving a fuck um, and just really being himself. And, and one of the things that most people realize about him now is that he really enjoys pushing people's buttons, right? So he started saying the kind of stuff that gets a rise out of people, uh, being intentionally, um, you know, divisive or, or intentionally provoking or intentionally controversial doing and saying things that he knows is going to get people's goat. Um, stop, stop trying to be what he thought people thought he should be and just what he wanted to be and what he felt. He was just being himself and, and it just uh, made all the difference in the world. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Again, it's Paul Rosenberg. It's Cigar Saturday. A lot more people joining us on Twitter. I'm seeing uh Ask uh, ask any questions you want. Tell us what you're drinking uh, to mix things up. Paul, since you said you're a McAllen fan, um, I got I got just I just grabbed some McAllen edition number five, the limited editions that are done every. Have you tried any of the limited editions? I haven't yet. No, they're they're really good. They do a, a new one each year. I think they're finishing the series this year, but. Um, they're, they're not a, just like a number and like the sequence of the series. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Uh, they started up with number one, I guess five or six. Years. They did six last year. I guess seven's coming or six might have been the last one. But they just blended a little differently from different places in the warehouse, and um, they're all sort of in honor of something else. But this one was really a nice one, so I'm gonna pour a little of this here. That's with a the color. It matches your yeah. tie. Oh yeah, yeah. There you Fancy. go. Yes, it does. I, know, Tom, I see what you're doing there, Tom. It's really, yes. uh, it's really something. <laughs> Tom, Tom did Very that nice. one on purpose. Yeah. We, we know. And I just I got did. another side text uh, asking what you think of Buffalo Trace. I, me? Yeah. Yeah, I like Buffalo Trace. Why not? It's good stuff. Yeah, it is good. It's getting. I know in some markets it's getting um, a little tougher to find than it used to be. Is is all? Let me ask you a question because yes. this is what what you're all about, right? Is yeah. there a time when um, this whole bourbon boom happened? What like four or five years ago, right? Um, is that accurate? Well, it, uh, okay. So we really consider it's a good question. Probably closer to ten, but the last four or five years have grown even more significantly. Okay. I started bourbonblog.com about fifteen years ago, and a few years after uh, I started it. Um, we really saw more and more craft distillers coming on the market. And just about 10 years ago, it really took off. But yeah, the last five have been, have been huge. Have been so really is, is that when the, cons when would you say like the peak of the consumer boom happened? I think it really started uh, 2008, 2009, really just got on fire in 2010. It was almost like uh, within, um, and they had been working towards it, but just releasing more and more whiskeys, more and more distilleries, more and more small distilleries coming out 
uh, of the woodwork too, um, you know, like the Hudson's and the Breckenridge and, and, right. and ones that had been, had belonged to family members, bringing them back like the peerless. So I would say 2010, but it's still growing. I, I mean, I think it's continuing to grow with more and more distilleries. Right. So, yeah. so there was a time when all that was going on and it was impossible to find good stuff in the store, right? Because as, as any good whiskey does, it takes time to make it. That's right. And there's also an, an, an aging period. So right. Like you can just ramp up production and make it just like with cigars, right? You got to have material. It's got to be aged and, and seasoned properly and cured um, and then rolled and then it has to sit there, right? So um, do you think that the industry in terms of production has caught up to the demand yet? And <clears throat> excuse me. Do you think that there is a potential of them catching up and making too much of it? Yeah, I think I think there, it's kind of a two-part uh, answer. I think they have to some degree. I think they're certainly trying. They're adding more and more warehouses, uh, more and more production. I think part of the problem is predicting it and also putting out the older whiskey because, as you said, take some time. They couldn't have predicted 15, 20 years ago people would want that and then it evaporates so much of it evaporates in the barrel so you're left with such a small amount um and could we eventually have too much of it uh it's possible i think that it will be a while before that happens back in the um back in the 80s and 90s they could hardly sell any of the 15 year old stuff that we pay you right. know way too much for now so i think yeah i think we could have too much sometime but i think it'll be a while if pappy van winkle was collecting dust on a shelf in the back of the liquor store right we could volunteer couldn't we we could volunteer to drink the rest right yeah or just mix it in with something you know all right well that's we'll volunteer. good volunteer and then and then the same thing um i i i know had happened with japanese whiskey right um there was like no supply everybody drank it all and uh I think that they're just starting to catch up on, on it too. They are, they are indeed. Uh, probably about, well, probably a little more than six, six or seven years ago, we really started seeing those becoming more and more difficult to find. And uh, they've been doing it for so long, but they finally started importing uh, a whole lot more. Uh, yeah. Yamazaki, hard. Do you have a favorite Japanese? Do you like the Yamazakis or what do you like? I like Hibiki. Um, it's nice. And there was a time where you know, you could get Hibiki 17 for a couple hundred bucks. And oh, yeah. then I turned around and it wasn't available or you were paying a thousand dollars for a bottle. Yeah. Crazy. Yep. Absolutely. I, and, and the Hibiki is nice. Uh, Toki, a little bit lighter, but very approachable. There's one called Nobushi that um, I don't think has caught on completely yet, but I really like the Nobushi. It's uh, about a four to five year old, but it's quite nice as well. I'll check it out. Yeah. It's good stuff. So many good whiskeys. Uh, people are telling us down below what they are trying, and um, more questions uh, coming in. Hey, hey, Maddie, there's a question for you though uh, from Chairman Lai. What's the secret of keeping Sanj quiet? Oh, watch out, Lai. He's gonna come for you, bro. You should know better, man. Look, that's look, a good look, question. He's smiling, on he's smiling on camera now, but you're gonna unleash that beast. I, I got to be honest with you, Tom. After Lai took a went flying off of that roof, he's gotten very very ballsy these days. Yep. So I'm just I'm just saying. So, look, when Sanj is still silent, Lai, you're in trouble, Chairman. I'm just saying. So he's, there's there's going to be an issue. He just uh, hasn't found anything to rant about yet. <laughs> uh oh. What happened? He said you don't have anything to rant about yet. Not yet. Come on, the night. <laughs> look, look, the night is young. There's time and uh. I just got another text. Uh, somebody wants to know what are some of your go-to sticks, Paul? Oh boy, uh, you know, there's a lot. I, 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 I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a whore when it comes to cigars. Um, I, I like a lot of stuff, um, and I don't limit myself at all. There was a time where um, I thought that you know, I only needed to smoke Cuban cigars. This was like, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. That. Some of the more new world stuff um, hadn't become quite as popular. The Nicaraguan stuff was just starting to really happen. And um, once that did, I, I really started smoking a lot more of that and a lot more of everything. But 
I mean, man, I, you know, you, you know what I like to smoke. I mean, Sanj knows what I like to smoke. I like to smoke a lot of the smaller batch stuff, a lot of the craft stuff, stuff from, um, from foundation, from, uh, crowned heads, from, from warped, from Drew estate, uh, from illusion, um, you know, uh, all of that stuff that that's, that's where my, my group is. Lots of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did, Sanj did you, just whispered. He wanted to know what about the dot head by Sanj Patel. <laughs> that, that's always at the top of any good cigar smokers list. You gotta have, you gotta have one of those. Any of the section eight, any of the section eight collection is what you need. Stop by Sanj's in Bloomfield, New Jersey and uh, pick it up. You can get a dot head or a snake charmer. And uh, ma make sure I'm not here. And if you want to shoot up the place, let me run out back. I didn't name these things. This guy. I'm just saying. And, uh, and Tom, I just actually got a question for you. Somebody wants to know if the uh, if you feel that the demographic, the age for, um, for bourbon drinkers has changed over the years since the boom came. I think to some degree, I mean, I think that more and more of the, uh, of, of the newer drinkers, those in their 21 plus uh, category are getting interested um, in whiskey a little bit earlier on, something a little more refined where it used to be a, more of a, um, an older person's drink. I mean, believe it or not, that's what they were saying back in the in the 90s. I think you see the, the groups in their the 20s and 30s, it has grown uh, by numbers and I, I see it growing. Uh, just good flavor, you know, they're wanting something with a story. It's a story that it has, it's that age. And I think everybody appreciates that. So, yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, more questions uh, coming in for um, Paul. And again, thanks, everybody, for watching and for sharing and tweeting. And just like every week, you take a chance, you share this, you like it on whatever social media. You do both of those. We put you in the drawing for that, uh, that bag of uh, bourbon barrel aged coffee from Janice Coffee Roasters. All right, uh, Landon, thanks for watching. Landon Bays, what does Paul love most about the music business? Oh, uh, gosh. Um, it's a good question. I, the thing that, that has always driven me is when, when I discover something um, that I think is great, or that I think has the potential to be successful, and that I get excited to develop and, and, and share with the world. Um, when you do that and it wins and you get to spread what you love to the rest of the world and they love it as much as you, that's like the best feeling for me. That's that, that success of having, having a gut feeling about something, developing it, working on it, sharing it with the world and having it be successful is um is a great feeling so that I, I would say that's what i love the most is is those those wins um on the stuff that you believe in right flip the flip side of that uh someone wants to know tom green or better question what does paul really dislike what do you what do you dislike anything you wish you could change what do i dislike the most um the business can be, it can be really frustrating uh, because there's there's so many layers and so many so many different different personalities and, and, and people. And one of the hard parts about working with artists is that they're not like a product, right? Sandra cigars are never going to tell them that they don't want to wake up and get in the store to be sold, right? Artists can say things like that and do things like that. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, with a human being as opposed to a product and um, it can make things challenging and, 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 you know, depending upon the human being, but um, you can make the best plans in the world, have everything set up the right way, do everything right. And if the artist decides that they don't want to do it or they, decide they're going to do it their own way or they want to change things around and it messes things up and you know it is what it is so i think that's probably a difficult part of it is just you know the the, the human element of of the product and um, the other side of that though is of course that that's what makes the artist great right and that's what makes them unique and their idiosyncrasies and their quirks and 
their individuality is is what makes them who they are. But um, it can be really challenging. Right. Right. Now, Paul, you were saying uh, you used to uh, rap, uh, write lyrics. I know. Do you do you still do you still dabble a little bit? Do you? I don't. Know? I, I I really don't. This is when I was like. 19, 20, 21 years old, you know, um, in college, uh, I started for a few years. Uh, but I, I, when, when I went to law school is when I was like, I, I need to probably start paying attention to some other stuff and spend my time on the books as opposed to on the mic. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I haven't in a long time. I, I think the last time I recorded something was, I think probably, Proof made me record something as a goof in like 97. It's probably the last time I recorded something rapping. But I rap for my kids all the time and they hate it. <laughs> Dude, critics are the worst, bro. The worst. Yeah, they hate it. They're like, no, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear a little baby. Get away. <laughs> Still, he still gets the audition for Denver. That's uh, that's good. Well, we were talking about whiskeys, bourbons, um, what and rappers, and, and fifty year old rappers. I'm not fifty yet. I'm almost. Is <laughs> it's coming up, huh? Oh yes, yeah. it's, it's approaching very quickly. Very very quickly. Um, you know, well, something nice to all spirits, whiskeys, bourbons. Any that you see in the recording studios? Does it ever add any uh, inspiration to uh, to what's around for for any of the artists you work with? Um. You know, Marshall is sober, so not not so much for him. Um, but you know, when when Dre and his guys are together, it, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of gin, um, and there's there's always some some cognac around. Right. Um, but those guys, what, what's the gin that they like? I think it's uh, is it Kendricks? Is that in the Kendrick's, big? Yeah, might be. Yeah, yeah. Ken, they love Kendricks um, at, at Dre Studio, and um, there's 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 a lot of cognac around, a lot of cognac. It's good. It's good to uh, it's good to be uh, to be well stocked, to be well stocked. Again, uh, if you're watching this, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, take a chance and uh, like this, share this. These are great questions, y'all. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking uh, the questions. Um, I got another text coming yeah, up. Um, yeah. And Paul, it's for you. They said. You thought Cubans were the best, and uh, what changed your mind that they're not necessarily the best? And there's you know, I, what I what I came to realize is that um, the best, and I think I've I've told you this before, Maddie. I think that the the best cigar is probably a Cuban cigar. If if you find the best Cuban there is. And you put it up against any of the best in the other categories, the Cuban probably wins, right? It's it's kind of like a French, like French wine. Like if you find the best Bordeaux, it's probably the best wine in the world. Does that mean that all Bordeaux are better than other wines from other places? No. And I find the same things with with, with Cuban cigars. Um, there's great Cubans. There's some not so great Cubans, and they have a serious problem with crop quality control, as you well know. Um, there's a lot of them that are inconsistent in, in flavor. Um, a lot of them are too tight. They don't draw well. Um, they don't burn well. Um, I find there to be much more of a tobacco beetle problem with Cuban cigars. So, um, you know, all those things just made me sort of try other stuff. And um, once I did, I just realized there's so much more variety. And like I said, I like that's what I love. I love the variety. And, and every time I walk into a, sh a shop, and, and Sanj will, will tell you this too, I always say, what do you have that's new? Because I just want to try new stuff. Um, and if you've got an honest shopkeeper, they'll not only tell you what's new, but they'll tell you what's good and what's new. So uh, I, I quickly find out if it's if it's a good store by what they're pushing me towards. And, and if they push me towards some bullshit, I don't go back. Right on. And the second part of that question is, uh, what Cuban is your favorite, or do you have a favorite brand or preference? Yeah, I, I probably would say the the Oyos are probably my favorite range of, of Cubans. Um, and if I had to pick one, I would probably say um, Epi 2 or Epi 3, probably. 
Right up. Good stuff. Now, Paul, you were mentioning uh, the blockchain technology a little bit earlier. Uh, you all had was it was it just a few months ago you released the uh, the Nifty Gateway? Yeah, on Nifty, yeah. on Nifty Gateway. This is, is the platform for for the NFTs we released. Yeah, right. Uh, good response to that, wasn't that? That those 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 yeah. really went. Uh, yeah, it did really well. You know, it, it's um, like I said, it's it's just such a quickly evolving thing. Um, and we spent a lot of time prior to the drop trying to educate consumers and, and um, M&M's fans on really what they were purchasing and um, how, to, how to do it. Um, but there's a big learning curve, you know? It, it's, it's so new that it's, um, it's just evolving every day. And, and things are changing so quickly. And there's, you know, there's a bit of a gold rush happening um, with people jumping into it and, and trying to get in, not just in terms of making drops and selling NFTs, but business-wise too, right? Everybody's trying to develop platforms and they're trying to be, you know, the leader in, in this category, or that category. Um, so it's it's very interesting to watch. And I think that, like I said, it's got, it's got a long way to go. Um, which is, I think, in the very early stages of where, where this is going to end up. Yeah, I agree. It's fascinating. I just, uh, now this has turned into a, a financial show, but there's one called Sia Coin, and everyone talks about cloud computing and what and what things are based upon. So this this Sia Coin uh, blockchain technology is actually based on, on, on cloud technology and how people send uh, and save their files up to the cloud. And so when you go through all these different technologies, their, their big thing is, how would you like to save stuff on the cloud that uses our technology for safety and security? That'll be, you know, one fifteenth or one twentieth the price, say, using uh, Amazon Cloud and stuff. So, just to what Paul was saying, it's so amazing how many different facets there are just with this technology and the capabilities. And up, oh, up, oh, Sanch has something that he wants you to uh, see. Paul, you went into the dungeon. Hold I'm, on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you <laughs> this so you get it tomorrow, Paul. Oh, look at that! Nice. Beautiful. Sealed box. It's yours, brother. It this was. Guy, it was sealed. Most... Won't be when you get it. <laughs> yeah. Man, he's going to grab a handful of those on his way out. Sanj, man, I don't know what to say. Thank you. Enjoy. That's amazing. Enjoy. That's all he's doing. I, I love it's, those. It's, it's, it's Sanj is like, uh, he's like a Willy Wonka of cigars, man. It, it, like it's weird, though. It's his limited edition box of seven. I could have sworn they were 25, but. I'm and he knows where every fucking cigar that he's ever got in that store is. Everything. He knows exactly where it is. Oh, you got the store and you got the museum. He knows both. Right. <laughs> Hold on. I, 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 I'll, I'll have to test these later for quality control. You, know, you may man, just have to. I was just talking about quality control. So, you know what? I think if I'm doing my job as a friend, I have to test at least, you know, 20, 25% of these sticks to make sure that the quality is there. I think I'm ready to um, to light this. Ready to light. The H99. Right. Well, hey, well, hey, tell, tell us a little bit about the H99. What what makes this a, a special Liga? Oh, wow. First, first and foremost, everybody's been waiting for it so long. So part of when the anniversary of Drew Estate came up, um, and I remember literally being in Nicaragua when they were working on the, uh, the test blends for that. So... When you light up and you fire up that stick, you get um, I'm trying to think of the, the best ways to describe the qualities of that cigar. So you get almost a citrusy note on it. Um, it's deep. It's uh, it's not what you get off of like a regular uh, Connecticut wrapper with it. So this thing is it's highly tweaked. So you're getting, you know, between medium to medium full on it. You're getting, like I said, you're getting some of those citrus notes that you're getting off the drag, right? As, as you go to start that up and you'll see that when you get on there. So really, it's not really like any of the other ligas in the Liga line. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest reasons everyone's clamoring to get hold of them because it's a little bit different take on what everybody has smoked previously in the, in the Liga blends. So yeah. that's why everyone's clamoring to get it. Obviously COVID put it, you know, <laughs> backtracked at a solid 16, 18 months, just getting it out because obviously the pandemic it everywhere and that was including Nicaragua so social distancing everyone needs to remember was with rollers and bancheros and things like that so you know much like the allure of the Cuban cigar is uh, a lot of people like what they can't have that that kind of happened with this stick because it took such a long uh, long time to come to fruition 
I want to say that the first samples that were in uh, that were in our hands when we were down in Nicaragua and have Walkins in what three years ago, Walkins? Yeah, three or four years. Yeah, ago. about yeah, about yeah. about three or four years ago when we first saw those, uh, those test ones, and I think yeah, that's when we brought oh, those, them up. Yeah, those were different. Yeah, and there's a there's a lot of depth I find in it, and it, and it also has like a a lot of that sort of tangy on the top, that like mm. tangy cedarness yep. at the same time. So it's almost like these two different levels going at once, um, which I think makes it unique in my opinion. Yep, and that's where you get, like I said, that, that citrusy cedar is yeah. notes that the, you're getting. The H, H tells you a lot on that cigar if people know what that H stands for. H, which is? H, H99. The most people would understand what that cigar would, what, what is that H stands for? And they will figure it out. But the reason it doesn't taste like any other thing because of that H. H is for hybrid. It's a hybrid wrapper. So very different, very unique. So a lot of people don't understand. They're like, what the hell is H99? What the hell is H99? But it's actually a hybrid wrapper. So that's why I think the color is even a little different. Is that coppery bronze color to it. And a lot of people, like, they look at it in the beginning, and they're like, oh, this don't look anything like Liga. And I'm like, no, dude, you know, it's just a wrapper. Good. Normal Liga is a very dark, very oily wrapper. This is a little bit coppery bronze wrapper, and it's a hybrid wrapper. Yep, so you're going to get nuances. So you get those different nuances that you don't get out of the other, right. out of the other Liga line. Um, so like I said, that's what makes it so sought after. Um, and like I said, anything that's new, of course, everyone wants to get their hands on. And when they smoke it, they're going to get an entirely different, uh, right. different taste than they are from the rest of the family, which I think well, is pretty cool. Can they get their hands on this, though? Well, you can, Paul. How many you need? No, not, not, me. <laughs> not me. I'm talking about I know whatever you want, brother. The, the average you know, Joe walking into, you know, Joe's cigar store. Is, is this an available stick? No. Oh, Joe's no. Sanch Firebomb. That's, oh, we weren't supposed to say that, right? <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Well, the cat's out of the bag. But uh, they're, they're kind of a constraint. They're rolling out there. Yeah. Um, so people who, uh, who are able to acquiesce it are people um, who've been in business for a really long time, have some of the bigger shops. And again, it's even been difficult to get them into the bigger shops because, again, of the constraints and everything got pushed back a bit. And this thing is just a smoke bomb, too, right? Uh-huh. Mm. There's just like endless like smoke coming off of it. Broadleaf. Yeah. Yep. It's a hybrid broadleaf. Yeah. So in broadleaf, broadleaf definitely That's throws up a lot of smoke. A lot of smoke. Yeah. Yep. So, so I was just downstairs, Paul, getting you this uh, Hoyo Epicure number two. And I found the original boxes of Liga Pravada L40s. Very first batch. Oh, I, I think what? since Paul's getting a box of Cubans, I mean, she'd probably call, you know, QC. What year did those come out? I'm sorry? What year did the L40 come out? 2010 or 11. Yeah, I think it was uh, uh, 2010. Yeah, it's 10 or 11. Yeah. Something like that. Wow. So, yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I feel no, like quality testing. A lot of Q, QC yeah. testing is going to happen with that, too. And even... Even walking, you saw that message, huh? Walking's trying to get us to open up Paul's box too. Like quality control is really important. We're we're your friends, dude. Want to make sure yeah. you're getting the quality, the Testers. quality stuff you want. It's, it's like the food's got to be tested, right? You got to make sure it's not poison first. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I greatly appreciate that, job. Yes. Cheers to that. Salut. Your drinks are more fun. Cheers. Than yes. So as we look at um, coming up, now, Matty, you were saying that today the uh, the mandate went off in New Jersey. Is that what happened today? Yeah, so it actually started yesterday. Um, yesterday. People started coming out, and there's there's lots of confused looks. People kind of like staring down at each other, you know. It's like uh, people feel like they're doing something wrong, you know, kind of like the dog, the way the dog looks at you. If he pees on the rug before you let him out, it's like, uh, uh, am, I, am I supposed to do this? No, no, yeah, I'm going to catch shit later. So it's uh, – <laughs> It's a little weird. My favorite part is still the people driving around in their cars with the mask on. You know, I'm like, oh, all right. Um, so, man, are you peed on the rug again? Yeah, you know, I have a problem. Man. Like I said, I, I can't get rid of all my issues all at once, man. There's a lot to work through. 
But uh, you know, it, it's it's just weird because we've been wearing them for so long, and and everybody's just you know, it's 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 like a you you, you gained a certain level of comfort, right? With wearing it, you felt like you were protected a little bit, and um, now that it's gone down so much in terms of the the infection rate, and so many people are vaccinated, you know, you don't really need it. I read an article not to get too much into the media and I, and I don't want to discuss politics at all, but um, there was an article that I read um, in, in one of the prominent West coast papers about um, there was uh, a 0.03% infection rate for people who were properly vaccinated out of a sample of about 3 million people, um, which is just remarkable. I mean, it's it's the the vaccine is more effective than they thought you got to try to get it and then you probably still won't get it once you've been vaccinated it's it's amazing i just had somebody send me a message go we sure see some of the strainness when we're at the bench <laughs> it's true it's, 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 you know it's true. i've only been to the bench once but uh i i guess i would agree with that remark yep it's exper it's an experience tom you you know, I didn't tell you, Maddie. I, I, I threw my back out, man. I, I, I don't, I don't do well on benches because of my lower back, and and that particular bench is not a fucking joke when it comes to your well, back. That's, well, there's Bring a good chair next time, bro. Now in the pro mobile, the truck now has three chairs in it, three husky, husky guy size Coleman chairs. So that that you know, they say they're weight tested to 350. I'd like to put it to that test and keep my eating going on. But uh, we now have soft. Uh, husky chairs now now on the truck, so we're we're good, we're golden. There'll be no more back because I'm not sitting on the fucking bench again. I can't do it. <laughs> yep, yep. But that that weekend, I just happened. It was I pulled the trifecta. I sat on the bench, I went bowling, and then I decided to go under my kitchen sink and try to fix something. So those three things combined, my back was like, "What are you crazy?" And I couldn't walk. Nope, you you got your own chair now, dude. There, there there's no more bench. The yeah. trifecta, you, got the trifecta. Back, you got a new lower back for me I can get anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a very troubling text. Did you just see that one? So I'm going to I'm gonna call you right out. Shad wants to know if, if Sanj has his hand on my ass. And what the fuck business is it of yours, Shad? And I like it. 2021, <laughs> boo. <laughs> Tom, I think, Tom, I think that's a different show. It might. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. We love you, Shad, and don't be jealous. That's all I have to say. Yeah, no, it's it's good to have you watching, uh, Shad Bates. We should probably, since Shad's watching again, remind everybody uh, here in just a few minutes, we will um, we'll pick a winner for that. Uh, again, to, to be part of the drawing, you have to both like it and share it on one of the social media platforms to get that uh, Janice Coffee Roasters um, bourbon coffee. Uh, we'll pick one winner here. Is that like a flavored coffee? Because I, I don't know if I'm into flavored coffees. But it's actually been aged in a used uh, bourbon barrel. Okay. Well, I guess that's yeah. different. It's kind of yeah, like a little bit. The barrel well, aged cigars. Basically, basically what happens is, yeah, the, the, uh, it's that bourbon is sweating its, uh, itself off. It, that there's about a couple gallons that is left in a coffee barrel, and yeah. it wets itself off to that, uh, that wonderful coffee, kind of like it's done on the tobacco. I'm going to put a link up there for everybody. That's the one Bourbon Blog has done with uh, Shad, uh, aged and used uh, Breckenridge barrels. So it's, it's good stuff. A little, little hint of that bourbon. And no Shad, alcohol. Single, he does a single origin uh, Nicaragua stuff, Paul. So we'll, we'll get you Amazing something. Amazing stuff. Out. So, so for the, I love for the that. in you. I love single origin. I love the sort of non-blended. I think I really like Mexican coffee. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably my favorite. We we on that chat. I know about Nicaraguan and Sumatra and everything. What do we what do we got, Chad? I know you're out there. And I think I also really love that Mexican San Andreas wrapper too. Oh yeah. Sold. So, I think those two are my 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 sweet spot. Well, as we're coming out of the um out of the pandemic, as you were mentioning, Paul. I mean, again, uh, you know, better better days ahead here. Any any trends, anything that it's going to do for uh, music, the music business in general, as far as the last thirteen months, whether it be with uh, trends in music, uh, lyrics. Obviously, people are excited to get back to uh, concerts. What do, what do you foresee as far as what? Well, I, I think maybe something interesting to point out is, um, 
you know, a, a lot of our revenue in recorded music now is is from streaming, right? Right. Um, and when the pandemic started, uh, the industry got a little panicked because streaming numbers went down. And if you think about why that was, when do people spend time listening to music, right? A lot of people spend time listening to music in their cars. Right. A lot of people spend time listening to music on their commutes to work, to school, from, back, right? Gyms. People spend time listening to music, working out a lot, right? So all of those things just like stopped. So there was a big sudden dip and we got nervous a little bit. Uh, but within a couple months, it picked back up. And that's because people gained new habits and they started listening to music at different times of the day in different places. They started working out at home. They started, you know, driving, but maybe not to and from work. Um, and you know, their habits just changed. Um, and then ultimately it, it went back to, you know, the place that, that it was in terms of overall volume of streaming. Uh, so that was really interesting to watch. So I'll be interested to see what happens, you know, once people really start going back out fully and once people are back at work, once people are really fully back in gyms and will some of those old habits stay? Will some of those old listening habits remain and maybe we have even more streams than we had before? Um, it'll be interesting to see how all that, that evolves. But, um, you know, like I said, te technology has been such a huge part of our business. And I think that um, in a weird way, we were all prepared for the pandemic because of technology, right? right? I mean, it, like even what we're doing right now um, I don't know if we would be necessarily if the pandemic hadn't happened because right. you guys started this thing out of boredom, right? Because you needed stuff to do and you wanted to engage with, with, with fans and, and an audience and you started this thing and it was born out of the pandemic. Yep. Um, and the technology fortunately was in place um, to help us all through this thing. Um, so. I think that's the other part is, is it'll be really interesting to see um, what what new technologies evolve and what sort of habits we picked up by being, you know, force of the circumstances that are going to be here to stay. Like, I don't think the Zoom call is going anywhere. I don't think the Zoom meeting is going anywhere. I think that we're going to still be doing that um, now more so out of convenience. Right. Um, so for me, those are those are the interesting things to keep an eye on. Not just for the music industry, but but um, for the, for the second part, just the world as a whole. Well said. Well said. Yeah, I'm and, not and, sure I'm going to be used to wearing pants again. You know, after the Zoom meetings and everything. yeah, or at least pants with like without a drawstring. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the first time I, I I put on a tie, which was like uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was like, oh my god, I I can't. I didn't even remember what it felt like. <laughs> To, to wear a tie. And then over the pandemic, I, I started riding my Peloton and I lost a bunch of weight and I tried on one of my suits and I'm like, I don't even have any suits I can wear. And and so I, now I have to go buy a new suit, which is a good problem to have, but that's um, good. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the clothing industry. Cause I think people either got like really fat or they lost weight because they had time to work out. It was like one of the two. Fortunately, um, I was the latter. You, that's, that's good that it went that direction for you. That's yeah, right. yeah, 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 I got to do both during the pandemic. I went, went, up, went up 30 pounds and then lost 35. So, you know, from from being on the road for the last 15 years, 100 to 120 days a year to, uh, to you know, sitting at a desk, you know, people look at their iPhone app and go, yo, dude, how many steps you have today? I'm like, 25. They're like, yeah, 2,500 is not bad. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah. 25 fucking steps. And that was to the kitchen twice. I'm like, this, this is dumb. <laughs> Some bad shit you know you get on the scale one at a time only please message comes out i'm like all right i feel you it's uh it's time to go drop some of that weight so i uh i had a chair that caught that had some serious stress so i had to go fix that problem yeah yeah and, and stay off the bench, buddy stay off the bench stay off the bench. <laughs> tell you man there, there's been an upgrade it's been a, you, you have your chair waiting for you one of the one of the coleman husky boy chairs that's right the upgrade is the upgrade has happened, and as Paul was mentioning, uh, yeah, we actually we we Maddie and I did start this during the pandemic, which is uh, 
it's pretty cool. We've been doing this nonstop every uh, Saturday for, um, I don't know, has it been 13, 14 months? No, I don't even know, Maddie. It's no, been, like, I think we're on our like 65th or 66th Might be 60 episode. something, almost 70th episode. All of those up on our uh, podcast right there, anchor.fm forward slash bourbon blog. This one will be too. So in case you want to go back and watch it, watch it on wherever you're watching. This will be up permanently. And um, also uh, up on our podcast. Um, any, uh, as, as you're getting back on the road now yourself, Paul, you were saying you're you're getting out well, there a little more, wearing the ties and everything? Yeah, and I, I'm not back on the road. I mean, I honestly, I haven't been west of the Mississippi since um, right before the pandemic. Right. Uh, and that's that's real. I, I haven't. And, and typically, you know, because of business is very bi-coastal, I would be out in L.A., um, you know, once a month or so. Um, and when, when I was running the when I was running Def Jam, I was out there, you know, multiple times a month. And now not having been there for almost a year and a half is, is crazy right. because ever since I got into business in, in a serious way, like, you know, 98, I've been going to L.A. constantly. And so this is the longest time I haven't been there since then, um, which is strange. But, um, you know, I've, I've been to obviously to Detroit a bunch. Um, I've been down to uh, to Florida um, and, and all over the sort of East Coast region from, you know, from here to, to, to Philly to um, to the Virginia and, you know, all around here. But, um, you know, looking forward to it, looking forward to getting back out there and, um, like anybody else, you know, um, just experiencing the things that we, we've been deprived of and, and, and haven't been able to experience. Um, it's going to be good. And, and, you know, just even even like I said, watching basketball games and seeing like a full crowd in there, like it, it's awesome. You forget how exciting and what a big part of the game a crowd can be. And, and, and I'm a sports guy, mainly um, – basketball, football, and, and, and boxing, but um, the crowd element, particularly in, in, in football, um, is just so essential. It's such a big part uh, of the game that um, I'm really looking forward to seeing a kickoff and hearing the crowd roar again. Amen, bro. Yes. Any uh, any particular team? Any or, whether it's sports or live oh, yeah. show? What are you looking oh, yeah. for? You know, I'm obviously, um, I'm, I'm partial to to my home squads. Uh, I went to Michigan State University. Um, I'm a known Spartan supporter. So for football and basketball, college that's my team. Um, you know, I I am a um, I'm still a, a, a supporter of the Detroit Lions, but I adopted the New York Giants when I, when I moved Whoa. to New York uh, <laughs> to over 20 years ago, um, which was a really smart decision. Two Super Bowls later, uh, love the Giants. Um, so that's my team. For, for baseball, it's uh, Tigers and Yankees, and for basketball, Pistons and, and the Brooklyn Nets. Right on, right on. As a Jets fan, I, I try not to talk about football. I you know I'll watch. Yeah, football. man, the, the, Jets are, the Jets are kind of like they're kind of like the Lions in some ways. Um, the Lions are worse. Um, there's a terrible statistic which I tell people when they're like, "How could you abandon the Lions and become a Giants fan?" And I say, "All right, let me let me give you the statistic. In my lifetime, plus 15 years, the Detroit Lions." have won one playoff game. One playoff game. That That's is, bad. That is painful. That is bad. One fucking playoff game in all that time? And that was with Barry Sanders? I mean, and it's the same ownership, too, over that whole period of time. So it's it's been tough. It's been tough. But, you know, it's where, it's where my heart is. I'm, you know, I'm always going to pull from my hometown. But I, everybody who's a Lions fan has a second team. They do. They all do. Whether they they admit it or not, they all have a second team because you you got to have some joy being a football fan somewhere, sometime, right? Otherwise, like it's it's pointless. So, um, yeah, the Giants became my second team. After that statistic, I will now sometimes walk out of my house with my Jets hat visible. <laughs> 
Yeah, the Jets. I mean, look, you know, they they got it. They things should be looking up for the Jets. I think. I hope. You know, I like I like to see New York teams win. I'm I'm not I'm not anti Jets. Yeah, I said that when Darnold was going to be the uh, the quarterback of the future. Yeah, so I'm just going to smile and wave and see what happens this year. He might be the quarterback of the future somewhere else. That's the sad part. He could he could turn out to be to be something really great. Where where did he go? Where did he get traded to? Jacksonville, right? Yeah. Was it Jacksonville? Well, he could turn out to be great down there. Who knows? Jacksonville drafted that guy Lawrence, right? So, so we'll, yeah, Jacksonville we'll, drafted Lawrence. He didn't go to Jacksonville. Did he go to? Or is it? Well, it wasn't Carolina, was it? Carolina. I think Car- yeah, yeah, he went to Carolina, Carolina right? Lawrence? No, no, Darnold. Sam Darnold went to Carolina. Carolina. Yeah, they, Carolina. They, my bad. Yeah. Yeah, Carolina. You get the expansion teams with the teal mixed up. Yep, yep, I I messed it up, but go, go I knew somewhere Niners, else where I'll probably do better than the Jets. Go Niners. Go Niners. Stop. We get Steelers fans near Niners. Steelers. Aye, aye, aye. Again, so, I'm a Jets fan, I just smile and wait. Is there a lot of people at Sanjas at, at 11 o'clock? Right? We, hear, we hear a lot of <laughs> – Yeah, yeah, there's – everybody is so happy to be out right now. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So, yeah. So – Front room's filled. We got people in this room. There's there's room in the back, and uh, shitty Jersey weather. So one of the few times there is nobody outside. <laughs> so so just it. just so I'm clear, because I don't even think I know what what's the rule in 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 Jersey for for masks? Is it just is it totally lifted, or is it just based on individual business ownership? Or what's the As rule? As of yesterday, it was entirely lifted, and um, the governor said that stores can practice whatever policies they still wish to choose. And then um, a lot of retail stores are keeping it one more week, and they get to peel the face masks off on the fourth. Don, what's your what's your policy, buddy? If you're good looking, <laughs> you don't have to have a mask. If you're ugly, keep the motherfucker on. Yeah, that's that stays it. that stays way past the pandemic. Right? I do have my luchador mask. I'll wear it. I, I know what I am. I'm yeah. proud. We have one of the female members, his sweetheart. I told her, I said, where is your mask? She goes, well, I don't have to wear it. I said, that's not the point. Point is, I don't want to see your face. She got mad. <laughs> Why? Just kidding. Wait, wait, hold on. See, liar, you happy? You had it. You had to uh-uh. say, you got to wait till the end of the show. <laughs> you got it. You happy now? You good? It's going to be tough to smoke the cigar through this. Got to have a hole somehow. I had my luchador mask on before. So. Yeah. I saw that. Do you, st- hey, do you have that close by still? Is that? Uh... I said, smoke with a mask. They, yeah, they said wear a mask. I didn't say what kind, so I figured luchador mask was was entirely. There was one point we, we, during the pandemic where we were um, on set filming something um, in Detroit, and there was a very strict COVID policy there. Um, even when we were outside, people were, wanted us to wear masks, and I wanted to smoke. And I had one of those N95 masks, and I took out my pocket knife and I cut a little hole in it. And just poke the cigar right through the mask. That's no, the that would that would have been an amazing. This would have been an amazing time to produce a mumble rap album with people wearing the mask. Yeah, like, like Kenny from South Park, right? Yeah, yeah. We call ourselves the Kennys. Yeah. Ooh, excuse me. Now, Paul, Paul, you mentioned uh, an artist you're working with. I'm actually from the border of Indiana, Kentucky, originally myself. The artist from Indiana. T- can you tell us about that artist? Yeah, he's from Hammond, Hammond, Indiana. Um, I know where that is. Vince Ash. His name's Vince Ash. Yeah. Vince Ash. All right. Excellent. And then we're going to be seeing some. Uh, yeah, new- we, we released one of his rec- uh, his album called Vito. Um, it's out on all streaming platforms um, from Glide Records slash Interscope Records. Um, we put it out. I think it was about seven weeks ago or so now. Nice. Yeah. So, nice. you know, he's, he's developing, um, but really, really talented, um, tremendous voice and, and, and presence. And I think um, has really, really great potential. Excellent. Cool. So be watching for uh, Vince Ash. It's actually out now on uh, all the streaming on the new album is. Yep. Vince Ash Vito. Check it out. Vince Ash Vito. Yep. And we just released a, uh, yesterday, we released a remix for uh, Eminem's song Killer from, from B-Sides of Music to be Murdered By. Um, and we've got Jack Harlow and um, 
Corday on it. So that just came out too. It's a fun record. Lots of really good rapping on it. High level, high level MC. Nice. Very Skill, nice. Skilled rappers. We like work, we like working with people who really know how to rap well. Cool stuff. Well, hey, uh, Paul, it's it's so great to have you here. Uh, Saj is uh, hooking you up with some cigars. I'm gonna make sure I send you also one of my favorite bourbons from Kentucky. Uh, I'm gonna get some some peerless your way uh, since you're uh, growing your bourbon collection. So we're gonna we're gonna add to that man cave with some peerless. So you're gonna grow that man cave. I bet it's a sweet. That man cave is uh, continuing to grow during the conversation. The man cave is doing all right. It's doing yeah. all right. It's it's one of the things like. You know, it keeps me going, and and my I have a very busy day from the, the moment I wake up um, till my kids go to bed. I'm doing stuff, right? And and I'm on the phone. I mean, even when I'm trying to like relax and I go over to Sanja's shop, I'm like on my phone or on the phone. And, um, it's just sort of nonstop. So my time that I have to myself, right? Like like now um, is what keeps me sane. And, and it's really, really valuable for me. And for me to be able to have, have two, three hours to sit down, have a cigar, watch some TV, watch some sports. There's some playoff basketball on now. Like that is my time. And, and that's what the man room is for. Nice. Very nice. Excellent. So do we have some numbers to tally for for this coffee there, Tom? We do. We do. We have a, we've had a lot of uh, shares, retweets tonight, uh, all across. We appreciate everybody watching us every week right here on uh, Bourbon Block Live. And um, let me say, we're getting the uh, the final the final numbers for that bourbon coffee. So we'll make sure we tell you here in just a moment. Uh, looks like it's going to be a number between. Um, one and seventy-seven. Let's have you pick that, Paul. Lots of like lots of retweets. Yeah, but, uh, what, per, number between one and seventy-seven, if you would please. Is that Janice Coffee? Um, right? I'll give you my high school football number. One and between one and seventy-seven. Yes, seventy-five. Seventy-five. All right, way up there. Seventy-five associated with the person that shared this goes to. Cal it looks it looks like she's saying California girl, but it's Calif Girl 101. Thank you for watching. Uh Calif oh, Girl. Wow. Whoever that California girl is, drop me a message there. California girls. It has to be for, for this win. Uh you won that uh free bag of um Janice Coffee Roasters Coffee. And uh Paul, thank you. This is it's so great to have you here. It's a really a pleasure. We're a fan of all you're doing there, and uh, best wishes to you and, and all your artists. And uh, we really appreciate you being on thank you. Saturday Live. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, I even got some cigars from Sanj out of it. Uh, <laughs> he did and, say and not, for me. Not a bad, not a bad <laughs> night's work, right? Not too to bad a deal. Guys, drink some bourbon. Smoke an H99 and, and, and get some um, a box of Cuban cigars. So I, I consider it a win. Excellent. And I'm sending you a bourbon. You're going you're gonna to have a whole lot oh, of good time. Too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. come on. What are you doing next Saturday night, guys? Yeah, we'll, just, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep the, the vices coming. That's right. <laughs> the man cave is a growing. The man cave right. grows. Well, man thanks, guys. I, I'm going to try to figure out how to sign off. Um, Oh, there's a stop camera thing here. That's what that's what I'm gonna do. All right. That's what you gotta cool. do. Yes. Thanks everybody right. for watching. Hey, Man, much love. Be great, guys. Much love, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Cheers. Work.